Um, and thank you to everyone for coming to the Mayor's Peduto's Clean Tech Roundtable. We are really happy to have everyone here. Today we have a very good crowd of experts, professionals, and um, passionate folks that are really devoted to the clean tech and sustainability sector. Um, and we're really excited to discuss the role of the city um, in driving innovation and clean tech going forward and how best to leverage and capture these opportunities. Um, I'll keep our remarks very brief, but I would just like to take the time to just welcome everyone and uh, send my remarks to the mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, for those that don't know Deborah Lamb, we, we brought her back to Pittsburgh. And what, what's important to understand about this, um, you know, there's been a lot of good things that have been happening in this city, a lot of it coming through uh, small businesses, nonprofits, the foundation community, the universities, the corporate community. But there hasn't been a partner in city government that's been able to harness, pull it together, and then enable it to take off even further. We brought Deborah in to do that a consultant who was an advisor on sustainable development for C40 cities throughout the world whose operation centers that she operated out of were New York, London, and Hong Kong. Somebody who has the ability not only to speak at the same level as those that are on the cutting edge, but the desire not just to implement the policy and why she came back home, but to implement it. That's where we're at. We're at a crossroads. Down the street, there's a big meeting going on with the EPA. And it's really a crossroads not only for this country, but for this city. Because we have the opportunity in Pittsburgh to change the way that we think about energy worldwide. And we have all the pieces of the puzzle already here. The history of building things and manufacturing and constructing it and the ability to do it. The innovation that's been part of our history for over 100 years. And the resources and the engineering and the mind power in order to create it. In order to do more than just have a debate over what type of fuel we should be using, but to create the types of buildings that don't need any. To be able to create the pipeline systems that take away from a 19th century type of idea of grid lines and systems that lose the energy in the process, and to be able to go to microgrid systems and producing through cogeneration. The opportunities to tap into all of the resources that are here in a city large enough to get worldwide recognition, but small enough to actually do it. And that's why all of you are here. You're the ones that are on the ground floor. You're the ones that can help us to do it when we look at places like the 28 acres in the Hill District, or the 280 acres in Hazelwood, or the 3.2 miles along the Allegheny River. And that's where the test labs happen. That's where the urban experiment becomes a reality. That's where we not only catch up to the places where Deborah's worked around the world, but we go ahead of them. And we show that we don't have to rely upon a 19th century system when it comes to energy, but we can create the 21st century model here in Pittsburgh. So thank you for putting this together. I've been told this is the first time that any level of government has pulled all of the leaders that are in the clean tech um, industry together in this city. But I can assure you this, this won't be the last time we get together. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we're really happy to have a few uh, welcoming remarks from a few, very few special individuals, the first one being Sean um, Garvin, who is our EPA Region 3 Regional Administrator, coming here as part of the EPA meeting. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I, I just want to echo uh, what the mayor said. I've had an opportunity to sit down and talk to, to Deborah twice now uh, since she has joined the city and, and her vision and her passion uh, on, on issues related to sustainability and, and clean technology is, um, is amazing. And, and so the city is very lucky. You are very lucky to have her mayor. Uh, as the mayor pointed out, there's something going on uh, down the street, um, which I took a little bit of a, uh, a quick break from to, to come uh, join you all here uh, for this discussion. Uh, it's our one of two days for public hearings uh, that we're holding on uh, our uh, 111D uh, clean power rule for existing uh, power plants. And, and so um, I know at least one of you, uh, Jim, have have been there. Um, I don't know if anybody else has has uh, attended, but you know our our goal and desire 
is to get the best feedback, best information before we, we put together a final rule. And so um, really uh, excited to see all the people who have been, have been joining us. But as important uh, and really why I'm here today is to really focus on what our path is moving forward. You know, there's been this, you know, about 20 years ago, there was this kind of false argument of the environment versus the economy and then it kind of started to fade out a little bit and over the last couple of years it seems to have have creeped back up um, and um, what I really appreciate about the dialogue such as this is uh, it very much underscores that um, they are not mutually exclusive and they actually go hand in hand there's a the evolution of new uh, green um, businesses and technology as well as um, the ability to take advantage of um, savings at the bottom line that also helps to benefit the environment and sustainability uh, innovation is really what uh, Administrator McCarthy uh, has really asked us all to look at um, doing things differently figuring out how do we leverage uh, opportunities um, I'm here to learn um, from all of you we at EPA fully recognize that we do not corner uh, the market on ideas. Um, it's really a lot of great things that you're doing, that cities are doing, uh, and our job is to help pass those along to others and say, hey, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, you ought to talk to X, Y, or Z. Now, Mayor, I have to warn you, um, you are been in for approximately seven months. I'm very much known for creating competition between mayors. Um, and so, be I'm with Mayor Nutter, or Mayor Rollins Blake, or you, or Mayor Gray, or uh, fill in the blank. Um, I'm constantly pointing out the good things that other cities are doing that others might be doing, not be doing. Um, I had the benefit of doing a, a roundtable uh, with a, a number of, of mayors, uh, small town mayors in, in Maryland. Um, and so we went around the room at the beginning and said, Tell me a little bit about what your city's doing. And it, it was um, very interesting. There was this dynamic of boasting. Uh, each mayor would say, well, you know what I'm doing. And so for the first half hour, that's what we went through. And then the second hour of the co conversation was, can you go back and tell me a little bit about that thing that you're doing that I'm not? Uh, how did you do it? How did you convince city council? Uh, and a lot of that goes along uh, with companies and chambers of commerce and, you know, our ability to learn from each other, our ability to, to transfer knowledge, our ability to figure out how we can do things better, faster, cheaper, that at the end has a community benefit. At the end, um, being good corporate um, neighbors uh, is really what this is all about. So one of my main roles is to take all the good things that you're doing and share it with other people in, in hopes that they uh, will pick up and, and build on that. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. You know, the challenges of, of climate change, the you know, challenges that we have from uh, stormwater and water quality issues, um, they're, they're not going to be solutions that EPA just comes in and says, here's the solution. It's really going to be grassroots, ground up. Um, our, we're focused on really, you know, Administrator McCarthy has said since she became administrator, she really wants us looking to make a visible difference in our communities. Uh, and that's really why I'm here today. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be engaged in this dialogue and, and thank you very much. First, while Pittsburgh's doing a lot of great things, um, we're, we're much bigger and connected to the region and to the state. And with that, State Senator Matt Smith. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the mayor, uh, Jim Doyle, at the White House Business Council, and, and everyone for being here. It's an honor uh, to be able to participate in this roundtable. And as uh, Sean said, you know, we've uh, evolved, I think, from the argument, the old argument, the false choice of either being pro-environment or pro-economic development to the point where we are now with Western Pennsylvania and certainly the city leading the way in, in a manner where we can say we can be pro-environment, we can be pro-economic development. There's not a better example of that than sustainable development, high-performance buildings, green buildings, if you will, where a small investment at the upfront level in an integrated design with the architect, with the contractor, with the labor force can yield benefits for that particular structure many times, many, many times more than the cost of doing it in a high performance way. And in many cases, we've gotten to the point where the high performance building is the same cost uh, as the conventional building but the high performance building will yield 
energy savings over the life of that building, sometimes as much as 30% per year. It will also yield us a building that, and a structure that lasts longer than the conventional design. So there are ways that we can do it. At the state level, over a number of years, I've championed a bill that would require uh, any project, um, either a retrofit of an existing uh, building or a new project uh, that receives any state funding. So redevelopment assistance capital funding, other grants from the state, loans from the state, uh, a requirement would be in place uh, in this particular bill where that particular project would be have to be constructed up to a certain environmental standard. And that's a way that the state can play a role in ensuring that new projects receiving state money, and it's not a requirement for every particular project, although I think that's certainly a discussion worth having, but any project receiving state funding would be required, the owner of that uh, particular building would be required to develop it up to a certain environmental standard. You can use LEED, you can use other high envir environmental standards. That's a way that the state can leverage its tax dollars, uh, the tax dollars that we're collecting from everyone in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, to ensure that the development that is taking place is to the highest standard possible, because that is something that will benefit the local community through added jobs, through our labor apprenticeship programs, as well as benefiting the environment. And when you think about buildings uh, consuming, I think, uh, about 40% uh, of the energy, 70% of electricity, and um, causing uh, about 39% of carbon emissions, if we're able to do this in the built environment, we can take a great step forward uh, towards not only growing jobs, but also improving our environment. So it's a real honor for me to be here. Thank the mayor, uh, and also thank Jim and, and everyone who, who's here today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and of course, just to raise it at the final notch at the national level, you know, we are hosting this in connection with the White House Business Council and Business Forward, and with that, Jim Doyle. The, uh, the White House Business Council is uh, working with Business Forward to make it easier for business leaders like you to uh, advise Washington in a way that's meaningful, efficient, and safe. Uh, our view is that Washington needs to do a better job listening to business, and that business for its part needs to do a lot better job helping Washington on tough problems like this. Um, this is part of a much larger effort. Uh, we've worked with Administrator McCarthy, John Podesta, the President's Senior Advisor, Dan Utek, the Principal Advisor for Energy and Climate, um, uh, the, Chair, uh, the Council of Environmental Quality, the Department of Energy. Uh, we've done briefings in 100 different cities, uh, and we're doing something like this pretty much every day. Um, and we listen. Uh, my job here today is really just to take notes and make sure that your questions get answered and your recommendations are considered. Um, I have just a couple points I want to make. The first is um, they really are listening. Uh, uh, you know, Sean is here in this room, but the, the EPA has is, is been tireless in going around uh, and getting input from business. Administrator McCarthy is the real deal. Uh, I've worked with 300 different senior administration officials. I've worked with 150 members, mayors, and governors, and she is definitely one of the most competent and committed people that I've had the pleasure of working with. Second thing I would suggest is if you're going to come uh, to advise Washington, uh, come to Washington, we're, we're host more briefings here, it's important that energy providers be at, in the, at the table, but you're much more effective if you bring your customers as well. Uh, talking, business leaders talking as consumers of energy um, really uh, are missing from this debate. Um, and it, so it, it's critical. Uh, and the third thing is uh, you're wasting your time if you're not candid. Uh, we believe that you can serve your country and yell at Sean at the same time. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so um, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm taking notes. Uh, we're looking forward to be back in, in Pittsburgh soon. Uh, we do fly-ins. Uh, Andrew uh, uh, has uh, been to one of our fly-ins at the White House, uh, and we will be doing plenty more on this topic. Uh, but thank you very much for coming, and uh, uh, I may be grabbing you after just to make sure I got your name right and got all your comments. So uh, if you if you have a comment and you want to make sure it gets to the uh, the White House, just let me know. Thank you. So we've had some really great welcoming remarks at the national, state, and local level. And the next two sections are going to be focused first half on just um, laying the scene, laying the groundwork. What is happening in Pittsburgh? You know, we have a, a five 
um, really brief presentations that don't necessarily do it justice, but really provide the, the lay of the land in terms of the clean tech um, industry and community in Pittsburgh. And then after that, we're going to open up for a, a more detailed roundtable discussion. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts. Um, and just to note that in addition to this being live at the City Cable Channel, we are also live tweeting this. Um, so if you follow uh, PGHIP, um, and we also have a hashtag, um, hashtag Clean Tech Pittsburgh. So please, please mark that, um, and we'll be, you know, making these discussions open to the public and following <laughs> up. But with that, um, this couldn't have happened without our sustainability manager, Grant Durbin. Thank you, Deborah, and thank all of you. Uh, I would like to first thank a, a special ode of gratitude to Claire Goodwin, uh, who is a CMU Hines School student. Uh, without her, this would not have been possible. Um, so she did a great job. Uh, so please be sure to thank her on your way out uh, after what will be, I promise, a great session and very informative. A couple of months ago, uh, Mayor Peduto, uh, if you're familiar with uh, his ability to, to navigate social media and uh, be prompt on a response, sent me an email and said, we need to be out in front on this. Uh, and effectively meaning the clean tech sector and the opportunity that we have here in Pittsburgh uh, with regards to harnessing the energy and the brain power that many of you bring to this conversation. Uh, so over the, the last several months, uh, the Office of Sustainability and the Department of Innovation and Performance have been working to meet with many of you and identify uh, who are the superstars out there in Pittsburgh in terms of both as being a thought leader, but also in terms of what firms are serving as the foundation for innovation. Today is a real special day in Pittsburgh. Uh, we started it uh, this morning with Sustainable Pittsburgh's Champions of Sustainability uh, in a very seminal event with regards to materiality and the role of corporate responsibility uh, and how that serves as a foundation moving forward with regards to how we understand both our environment and economic opportunity. So just to set the scene for today, uh, what you're going to, to have an opportunity to participate in is a series of five initial presentations uh, of some very forward-thinking people uh, that are setting the stage here in Pittsburgh today. Uh, each presenter will have three minutes to provide uh, some brief remarks and some concepts uh, that we think provide an opportunity to build an agenda uh, for a more sustainable Pittsburgh. Our first presenter is going to focus on green buildings and the issue of uh, materials. And Richard Piacentini from Phipps Conservatory is going to speak about the Living Buildings Challenge and the role that they have provided at Phipps in terms of materials and the integration of systems with the construction of their new facility up there on their campus. That will be followed by connecting university talent to the local community and Stan Caldwell from Carnegie Mellon's Traffic 21 and he's also going to be introducing a new concept here in Pittsburgh, which is the idea of Sustainable City Year. Following Stan will be a, a topic on corporate manufacturing and sustainability, and Kim Kippen McDonald from Bear Material Sciences, uh, who serves as the head of sustainability for their North American operations. Next up then will be local clean tech manufacturing with Ron Godovic uh, from Winstax, their founder and CEO, a manufacturer in our own lovely neighborhood of Lawrenceville. Uh, who is taking manufacturing to the next level. And then Councilwoman Deborah Gross is going to talk a little bit about neighborhoods and the role that neighborhoods have in shaping a foundation for companies to make, become a welcoming place uh, for businesses. So we really look forward to the conversation. Um, this is an exciting opportunity, and as the mayor said, this is the first but definitely the beginning uh, of a larger conversation uh, that we look to be uh, participants and take leadership in. So with that, I'd like to offer up Richard, um, and welcome again. Thank you, Grant, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for allowing us to be here. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I'm on the board of the International Living Future Institute, which is the originator of the Living Building Challenge. And I'd like to talk to you about an opportunity I see based on our experience with uh, opening the Center for Sustainable Landscapes, which is considered to be one of the greenest buildings in the world right now, and it was designed to meet the Living Building Challenge, LEED Platinum, Sustainable Site Certification, and a new one called the Well Building Certification Program. And there's one thing that's in common with all of these things that I think is really important for us to recognize, and that is, has to do with uh, a lot of these uh, green building standards require 
you to use local materials. And it's interesting if you look at Pittsburgh, that Pittsburgh is within 500 miles of half the population of the United States. That opens up a really good opportunity for us. The other thing that a lot of these uh, standards are looking at right now is getting toxic chemicals out of building products. And the Living Building Challenge has put out what they call the red list of toxic chemicals that they'd like to see out of these products. And it's interesting to me, uh, you know, here we built a building that's net zero energy, net zero water, and you think that'd be the hardest thing to do. Turns out getting, finding products that don't have these toxic chemicals in them was really the hardest thing we had to go through. And again, that creates a new opportunity for us. And the International Living Future Institute is interested in setting up an East Coast office. They're based in Seattle right now. They're interested in coming to Pittsburgh because of all the great things that are happening in Pittsburgh. And they retain having a national and an international agenda. However, there's one thing that they're very interested in doing, and that is pushing the red list. And they recognize that if you create a demand, you have to have a supply to meet that demand. And they see a great opportunity to meet their national agenda, and I see a great opportunity for us to really put Pittsburgh on the cutting edge and ahead of the curve of what clearly the world is moving towards uh, these types of standards. It's looking for getting healthy building products so we could be ahead of the curve here. So the opportunity is for Pittsburgh to become the center for green, healthy building manufacturing products in the United States. And we can do that based on the great history we have of this region of manufacturing, the great history of innovation. We have people in this region that are not afraid to be entrepreneurs and take a risk and do new things. And we have fabulous universities and creating cutting edge research in this region. So the process we see is to engage the Living Future Institute to relocate an office here, get involved in doing original research with the universities, partnering with manufacturers in this region, and start to create the new products that are going to meet the demands for the future. Not only retooling existing products, but also creating new products and working with existing manufacturers and creating startup opportunities for new build, building uh, new manufacturers. I think this is a great opportunity for us to be ahead of the curve that really capitalizes on our past and looks forward to the future. And I guess the question I have to ask is, do we want to follow or do we want to lead? And I hope we choose the path to lead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to be here today, and uh, thanks to everyone else joining us. This is an uh, exciting time for Pittsburgh and exciting uh, opportunities here. Um, I'm with the uh, Traffic 21 Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, where we focus on uh, smart transportation, but there's kind of a wide um, breadth and depth of um, tech, clean tech going on from the building systems to smart grid to alternative fuels. And we all work in a coordinated way at Carnegie Mellon where, again, I'm looking at one piece of the pie from the transportation side, but this is all coming together now in kind of what we're calling a, a smarter cities type of uh, atmosphere. Um, from the beginning of our initiative, uh, our, our institute was kind of initiated about five years ago with support from the Hillman Foundation and Henry Hillman really encouraged us to take research and development and deploy it in the community and deploy it in Pittsburgh, make Pittsburgh a test bed. Uh, fortunately, with the administration support here and with the county and the state, you know, we, everyone's been very receptive to saying, yes, we want to be a test bed. We actually want to use technology to be able to advance our region, and we've been able to do that. And I'm going to give one example here um, where this was uh, our adaptive traffic signal system called the Shore Track system. You know, one of the problems was with, you know, how do you increase capacity without building new infrastructure? And how do you, um, how do you address issues with emissions? Again, without, without building new capacity, how do you get more out of your existing capacity using technology? And so this was a, a project that was uh, first deployed in 2012, and uh, we started with nine intersections in the neighborhood of East Liberty, and uh, it's been expanded to 18. It's going to be expanded again this year to a total of 43 intersections. But as you can see from the slide, um, what we did was we used uh, faculty in our uh, robotics institute, and uh, they came up with a very innovative way of using um, using technology to put in adaptive traffic signal systems that allow a much more efficient flow of traffic using real-time information from all the intersections and having them communicate in real time. 
and the results were um, reductions, 24% uh, reduction in travel time, 40% reduction in stops, 42% uh, reduction in wait time, and, um, and maybe most importantly, 21% reduction in emissions. Um, this was funded in part by the Heinz Endowments Breathe Project, the R.K. Mellon Foundation, the U.S. Department of Transportation, University of Transportation Center Program, uh, in cooperation with PennDOT and Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. So again, a lot of partners, but this is one example of how you take technology, cutting edge technology at the university that's being done nowhere else and actually deploy it in a real world situation in Pittsburgh and have Pittsburgh not just be the beneficiary of the actual technology, but be able to grow the industry here in the region as well. So we were looking, you know, we were talking to, to Grant and to uh, Deborah and to, uh, and, to, um, and to other folks in the administration and saying, you know, how can we, um, how can we do this on a, a larger scale? And how can we integrate it, not just with one project, but do it more holistically? And we were recently at a conference where we saw a presentation from uh, University of Oregon Sustainable City Year Program. And this is an initiative where the university picks one city, and what they do is they go to different city each year, they pick one city, and they take all their different resources at the university, existing courses, existing research, um, existing uh, faculty projects, and kind of focus on an initiative at the city. Um, what we're proposing is that we work with the university and multiple universities in the, in the city and work with the city to try to address issues in a, in a holistic way. So this can be issues of clean tech or whatever the, whatever the, the city puts forward. And so the idea is that the city would identify the, the issues and the problems and the universities would utilize their resources to address these and it could change over time or it could remain for a multi-year basis. But it's a way for the universities to be able to transfer their technology using the city as a test bed, and, but for the city to increase its capacity to be able to tap into research and assets that are here in the community. And the final, um, the final aspect is even adding kind of a presidential management fellowship type of program. It's also done on the state level where we take some of these students that are having, because the students love the experience of working on the real world problems and working with the city, but if you take that to the level where then they can actually start to be integrated into uh, jobs within the city as well, that could be a great workforce development asset for the city and um, very encouraging for the students. So it's just a new idea that we're proposing and uh, uh, clean tech might be a, a good avenue for it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for having us here. I'm Kim McDonald, Head of Sustainability for Bear uh, North America. So everybody knows Bear as the aspirin company, and while that is true, uh, our global enterprise consists of three subgroups. Bear Healthcare, of course, the aspirins, the pharmaceuticals, and the consumer care products, but crop science, which focuses on crop protection and seed development, and material science, high-tech polymer materials. Pittsburgh has been home to Bear Material Science Division since 1960, <coughs> one of the biggest uh, markets that we serve is building and construction. Our polyurethane-based insulating materials lead the market in efficiency and, and sealing the building envelope. Our polyiso board insulation is a leader in uh, roof applications. And our polycarbonate materials go into new and developing technologies like LED lighting. They make the lighting more durable, longer lasting, and the, and the diffusion of the light more aesthetically pleasing so that these products are developed uh, with the market in mind and, and they're brought up into a larger scale on the market. So it's all about energy efficiency with the building technologies. We want to reduce the consumption, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, make things more comfortable in what are usually hot summers and colder winters. And um, the picture on the left, by the way, is of the Energy Innovation Center. It is a spray foam interior application, and we're delighted to be working with Pittsburgh Gateways. Bill Recker is here from that organization, and we know that that 
is a project that's going to bring a lot of focus to the city. It's going to bring workforce development, job creation, and uh, you know, leading ed edge technologies for energy efficiency in the future. So sustainable product lines, yes, we, we are really concerned about that, but uh, the sustainable company aspect of things. We celebrated 150 years last year in thinking about future strategies. Uh, we developed our first integrated annual report where we took our environmental and our social performance and directly tied that strategy to the future strategies for economic development for the company. So everything from innovation to employees to developing our future workforces are tied into that integrated strategy. Uh, carbon disclosure project in terms of climate focus is something that we have been an ardent supporter of. Since 2005, we've either been at the top or very close to the uh, leadership and performance index for the carbon disclosure project. It, it's really important to understand on a global scale what your performance is like at your sites and with your products and working up and down the value chain uh, from a life cycle perspective of your products so that we're able to develop reduction targets, new technologies that reduce our production consumption of energy and, and uh, across the product lines. And beyond sustainability, corporate social responsibility is a hallmark of Bayer's um, uh, strategy. The USA Foundation is based in Pittsburgh. Regionally, we fund a program called BASIC, which targets uh, STEM education and science literacy. Um, our president, Jerry McCleary, is on the board of directors at the Allegheny Conference and working with organizations like Sustainable Pittsburgh and the Green Building Alliance and Passive House Institute is where we get a real opportunity to work with the users of our products so that we can develop the technologies and, and advance them knowing what the market has in mind and knowing what the research needs are. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Godovic. I'm the founder and CEO of a company in Pittsburgh called Windstacks. We manufacture vertical axis wind turbines and install them. Uh, we are located down in the uh, Pittsburgh Strip District, and it's really an honor for, uh, for us to be here today. Mayor Peduto, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're happy to play some small role in, uh, in uh, participating in this kind of revolution that is green energy. So with that, I'm going to hit you with about a one minute video uh, because I can tell you about what we build but until you actually see them, uh, you won't believe it. So. So what you're looking at right here is a uh, installation that, that we just recently did in uh, Ligonier, Pennsylvania. But, and that's the, the two wind stacks uh, that uh, we installed out there. So what's, what's interesting about uh, our product is we've chosen to uh, service the small energy market, uh, whereas wind turbines in general have just increasingly gotten larger and larger. They've quite literally push themselves offshore. Uh, we've chosen to stick in a smaller market. Uh, uh, there, there's a trend in the utility business, particularly in Europe, but it's just starting now. New York just uh, passed some new legislations just yesterday. There's really a trend away from centralized power to distributed power. You know, our, our infrastructure is aging, and you, uh, there, every time we have some type of a national disaster, it kind of comes to the forefront. Places like New Jersey, uh, Staten Island, out of power, weeks at a time. So every time that happens, uh, our phone rings off the hook. <laughs> so uh, it, it's an interesting market. I could talk about the technology all day, but what I'd rather focus on is 
why are we in Pittsburgh? Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, is, uh, it's, it's home to me, but we really could have set up our facility anywhere. Um, and frankly, we looked in Colorado, Wyoming, Florida, et cetera, but we kept gravitating back to Pittsburgh. And the real reason, the main reason in our location decision criteria is because we still make things here. Uh, that, that's pretty rare in, in metro areas. So all of our employees at uh, Winstacks uh, are, were hired, they were unemployed, and we actually put them through a training program because everything we're doing, we're using completely new uh, and green technologies, uh, low VOCs through the entire distribution process. Even our products are thought of in, in terms of cradle to grave. Uh, our foundations are even recycled utility poles that, that we buy and repurpose. Uh, so with, with that in mind, uh, Pittsburgh has this core of, uh, of, of skills and, and skill set to kind of t technical aptitudes, if you will, that uh, we can train people here and keep uh, and keep growing to our workforce. So frankly, we can't build our units fast enough. We're in about 10,000 square feet in uh, the Strip District. Uh, we're in Alcoa's uh, founding location. So we like to think there's some good manufacturing karma there. Of course, whenever a tool goes missing, we blame the ghost of Alcoa, but that's okay. <laughs> that, that's okay. Uh, we're already looking to quadruple our size. Uh, every time uh, we install one of these, we have them as far away as Kansas to uh, down south in Virginia. Uh, frankly, last year as a business decision, we've only been in Pittsburgh for a year and a half, by the way, but the, uh, we decided uh, to concentrate on the southwestern Pennsylvania market because every time we build one uh, away from us, we just get inundated with, with calls and, and uh, interests, and we really just can't keep up. So uh, we're regrouping now and about to go uh, uh, undertake a growth, growth spurt, second funding round, et cetera. So um, I'm here to, to help. Uh, tell you guys what it would take for a typical manufacturer like us to grow and thrive in Pittsburgh, and hopefully that'll be of some use. Thanks. Hello, everybody. How are you? Can you hear me? I feel like our microphone's a little bit far away. Thank you, Mayor Peduto, for convening us and to the Department of Innovation and Performance, because this is a really exciting event. I'm really, really honored to be here with such a great group of people as well. Um, so I have no idea how to use this thing. What am I doing here? There we go. Okay. That's not it. Um, so I am um, City Councilwoman Deborah Gross. I represent District 7 in the City of Pittsburgh of nine council districts. I should have brought a map. Um, I represent a district that starts in the Strip District, starts downtown here at 11th Street at the, um, at the Convention Center, and travels all the way up the Allegheny River, all the way to Washington Boulevard. So the 3.2 miles that Mayor Peduto was referring to of potential riverfront development um, is entirely in my district. Um, that includes every inch of the Strip District where Ron is located, um, every inch of Lawrenceville, including, and also Polish Hill, all of Bloomfield, most of Friendship, most of Stanton Heights, plus all of Morningside and Highland Park. Really vital city neighborhoods. I mean vibrant, dynamic city neighborhoods. These are the neighborhoods that you see on the national news. These are the neighborhoods who put their community plans together 20 years ago and have all of the reinvestment that um, we're so excited about today. In the Strip District alone, not only do we have wind stacks, not only do we have legacy engineering firms like Chester Engineering, who is redoing all of our um, water infrastructure as a subcontractor to the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, but we also have 1,400 residential units under construction or almost under construction. That is a big chunk of the mayor's goal of 20,000 new units. And that's just one neighborhood in District 7. I think I also have about 500 residential units under construction or almost in Lawrenceville, well over 300 in Bloomfield as well, and many more um, individual homes that are under construction. Those are all just rental units, by the way. Um, so what we've done in District 7, um, and I'm, I'm fortunate to represent these organizations, is put together the plans that have succeeded for live, work, play. And that's why we, not, we thought we had three of the clean technology firms that um, Grant had identified. But when I sat down at the table here, I met the four. So we actually have four of the clean technology firms that we're here today to discuss located in District 7. Why? Because you can live right there with work, 
millennials who don't own a car, don't want to own a car, want to be able to walk to work, want to be able to have vibrant public places where they spend their time. Those are the District 7 neighborhoods that I mentioned. We also have a combination, because of our industrial past, of vibrant commercial districts, residential, you know, high density residential, and industrial zoned plots. So you're able to do the manufacturing on site as well. Um, so that's one of the reasons we also have a robotics cluster in District 7, burgeoning in Lawrenceville. Um, so again, we have the manufacturing, we have the new tech, and we have the clean tech firms all coming together, as well as you can get, of course, your handmade raviolis and sausages and all your food that you want. Uh, it's a food destination for your local war population in the Strip District as well. Let's see what I've got in the next one. Um, so, and that's, I think it's actually an interesting point. So we have the, the, the kind of the Pittsburgh that you love, the authenticity um, that we know that is Pittsburgh, that it's a real place, it's a unique place. Plus we also have um, the, the, um, the new millennials. Uh, it's where they want to be. And it's, it's the kind of place where um, it's important to grow things from the ground up. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have entrepreneurs cho choosing it people who want to make things here, the people who are interested in investing their companies in Pittsburgh find that, that zeitgeist of reinvesting here um, in District 7. I'm just going to spend my time promoting District 7 since that's my job. Um, but uh, we, we have you know, some, some opportunities and challenges that are representative of the city as a whole, not District of District 7, but I can, I can talk about District 7 more effectively. Um, so pressing needs, um, I think, provide the opportunities um, to do clean technology. The mayor has talked about this repeatedly. We are rebuilding our city from the ground up, all right? It's an old city. We're building now for the next 100 years. And so we have the opportunity to provide economies in rebuilding new utilities, new water lines, new roads, new neighborhoods. In District 7, we're already shovels in the ground. And there's a lot more that's being planned. Uh, we have one project that took 12 years to put together in the Penn Avenue Reconstruction Project in Bloomfield and Garfield, where we actually did dig down 20 feet deep with the Penn Dark Project and put in the new electrical lines, the new water lines, new sewer lines, and, and putting the road back in place. And I'm hoping it's going to be the most beautiful road in the city of Pittsburgh when it's done, because it's been a lot to live with. Um, Talking about clean technology, I had to look it up. I had to Google, what, what are we talking about with clean technology? What is this new rubric, right? So we talked about it being where business you know, meets environmentalism or environmental goals. But I've seen other regions define it as a combination of firms who are doing the, the smart transportation initiatives, the smart city initiatives, smart buildings, um, and also water management. My god, that, that's, that's what we've got is opportunities and challenges, right? But we're already starting to do that. Um, here, right? We're under construction now. So let's think about how we can do these test programs. Can we put in a smart grid? I would love for it to be in the strip district. I've got 1,400 units of new residential happening, and I've got the technology firms who are there and, and are, are um, doing that work now. We're already tearing up the streets, right? So let's make sure that we do it right when we put it back together again. Um, we also have, I believe, so I just uh, campaigned last year and spent my time knocking on doors, we have the population who are ready to do this kind of adoption. So when you're talking about decentralization of power, I think all of these technologies, even water, stormwater capture, this is all decentralized. You're talking about the consumer. So you're not talking about a centralized water management system. You're talking about people's rain barrels. You're talking about asphalt parking lots. So we have, I think, the population in District 7, uh, who I stood on their front doors and talked to them, who are eager to do this. They're already doing this planning for the next 10, 20 years now. We have 10th Ward Lawrenceville has its own stop stormwater mitigation plan. They're greening a city playground. We've removed the playground equipment. They're putting in an orchard. They're not just putting in an orchard. They're putting in an orchard of native species that has stormwater capture plans on site. So uh, we've got the people who want this technology, uh, we have the places where the technology firms want to be. Um, and my last plug is that uh, we've got, I think, a, a level of expertise here in the room and, of course, in my district that is, it's a combination when we're looking for solutions of, of, of materials, of hardware, and software, right? And so that's what we see also coming together. You can sit at a cafe in District 7 and listen to people on their laptops designing something for a 3D printer. 
right? And you can walk across the street and, and see someone putting up a wind turbine. So um, I'm excited to be here. I can't wait to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you very much. Well, that's very inspiring to have speakers uh, sharing all the latest frontline ideas uh, that they have for our region. Uh, it's also remarkable to be able to be here and have this conversation. So uh, once again, uh, very many thanks to Mayor Peduto, uh, to Grant Irvin, and to all of you for being here and for making this possible. It really is a remarkable turnaround as you compare it to where we had been in the past and where we are going. The comment that uh, we are, we have an opportunity in front of us if we move quickly and smartly and find a pathway for how to structure all this, we really could rise to the top of the pack and do something that is remarkable on the world stage. Uh, so that's what the purpose of this part of the discussion is, is we want to, first of all, uh, give an opportunity for people who want to react to what you've heard so far from uh, these anchor presentations that we've, been, that we've heard so far, but also for you to be able to contribute and make suggestions for how we can organize ourselves, move forward, find ways to partner with the city and the, pri the private sector and the nonprofits and the universities to make a difference. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Matt Mihalik. I'm the program manager at Sustainable Pittsburgh. Sustainable Pittsburgh's been working to try to accelerate sustainability practice going back to 1998. Uh, it's been a lot of uphill type work. And now there's this threshold that's here, and it's very exciting. So we're very honored to be a part of that. Um, so uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is open up the discussion to people who would like to comment on the presentations that you've heard so far. Is there anything in particular that resonated with you or something you'd like to hear more about from the presenters? Um, so we'll open it up with that. So everyone is satisfied with that. And it's sort of like, yeah, that makes sense. Those are great ideas, so let's move forward. OK. Um, so then let's move on then to other ideas and suggestions that people have about how we might be moving forward. So for example, how do we structure ourselves to work with city and nonprofit and for-profit? What are some things that people have seen happening elsewhere or would like to see that we need to start moving on? Well, if I can just. I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you. Not to, to date myself, but I feel like I'm ho hosting the match game or something with this, <laughs> with this microphone. Um, but you know, one of the things that we're really focused on is, is really how do we leverage resources? How do we leverage activities? We, we're, we spend so much time in silos. Um, you know, the president has made it very clear to all of the federal agencies. Um, you know, we need to be working together. We, we've been. Um, in the last five years, uh, EPA, HUD, Department of Transportation, GSA, Labor, we're all, all looking at finding opportunities where we can tap into each other's abilities. Um, EPA doesn't have as deep pockets as some of the other agencies, so we're also looking to tap into maybe some of their, their funding as well. But how do we start looking at these things at all levels so that we're not just focusing, you know, using the example of, of a street project. You know, the history is, oh, we've got to repave a street, so we just focused on repaving the street. Now we need to be thinking about how do we look at all the other advantages that we can take? How do we incorporate stormwater? How do we incorporate community aesthetics? How do we, when, you know, you're redeveloping a site or you're retrofitting a building, how do you look at ways in which you're not just looking at the project that you had in front of you, but kind of going through the mental checklist and maybe the physical checklist of where are some of the other opportunities in which we can do more and add maybe pennies on the dollar on our investment instead of doing these each as separate projects and each carrying their own costs. There, there, was, a, there was a community in Maryland, uh, they had a they had some road projects they needed done. The local high school was looking at, at fields, that, new athletic fields. Um, they were trying to figure out how they, they did their lift on, on the Chesapeake Bay and, and water quality, and they also had flooding. Well, that could have been 
four or five different projects, but they got together and figured out how do we put this together as one project. And so the school district was putting a little funding for it, the transportation department, um, you know, and there was a lot of different pots, so it was exponentially less expensive than if they try to do them all separately. And I think that that's where the opportunity, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about how do we do things differently, it's how do we start crossing over those lines and, and tying larger advantages into individual activities that, that may be the catalyst for, for what gets us to, to the larger picture. Can I follow up on that, sure? Because I, I want to add a little Pittsburghese to it, okay? It's uh, exactly what you're saying exactly that the model that the president's put together with interagency cooperation, so the transportation project works with HUD, the, that there's opportunities for people of different income to have public transit access, works with EPA so it's being built right, is what we need in Pittsburgh. And what we need is for folks in the room to start thinking about this. We're gonna go into an agreement with, um, with EPA and it's going to require us to spend over $3 billion to fix our combined sewer overflow. That will be the only time we'll be able to address the Green Boulevard project. How does the Green Boulevard project become part of the plan that we submit to the EPA so that at the same time we see that development happening in that 32.2 miles of riverfront development for the next 100 years? We're gonna redevelop 28 acres in the hill and we're gonna make sure that it connects to the middle hill in the development and affordable housing as a component of that. What are the standards that should be included in that 28 acres when we go into the agreements and we're spending taxpayers' money that make sure that we're hitting all the different things that your organizations or your companies are creating? And then we have 280 acres down in Hazelwood. And we have a foundation community that, that doesn't want to meet present-day standards. They want to create the next level of standards. And they're working with not only local companies but national and international consultants to be able to do that. What does that mean? Because when we start leveraging our public dollars into it, we want to see those dollars encourage the industries to be here. When Richard went to create the greenest building in the world, he didn't have to look past this region in order to do it. We want to make sure that those businesses that are here become a part of it, and then we want to export it like we exported steel. That's, and we have the opportunity to do this, guys, for real. We got these major developments that are all going to require federal assistance, state assistance, local assistance, and even the county. And we have a partnership right now that can compel them as they're doing it to hit those standards. But we need your help in saying what those standards are. Thank you. Comment. Hi, my name is Matt Graham. I just wanted to just leapfrog off of what Sean and the mayor were just saying, because we've been focused on water for the last a decade or so in this region. And in the last two years, we've pulled together all the best infrastructure systems into one system, system, so to say. And there's some opportunities in Pittsburgh that don't exist in the flat cities. Here, our water gets concentrated into like 12% of the locations get 50% of the flow. So that can be a great savings. But the thing that the mayor's office can do and the government can do is just what you were talking about. There's really no reason or incentive for any of the utility companies that have infrastructure in the ground, that have it under the street, to coordinate. They don't necessarily have a mechanism to share right now. But Utility 21, like Traffic 21, could be the same type of thing, where when we build stuff for the stormwater, we could save a third of the cost of the stormwater installation, making it a $2 billion project maybe, rather than you know digging up the street twice. So thank you. So there are some asset management programs out there that allow the coordination of uh, construction under streets and so on, and they've been adopted in other parts of the country. So if we can look into how that might work, that actually could be quite helpful. Okay, other comments that people have is in follow-up. And, and it's helpful if you say your name before you give a comment, that would be great. Hi friends, uh, my name is Andrew Butcher with uh, GTEC Strategies. Um, pivoting off of the, the comments uh, regarding uh, <clears throat> interdisciplinary coordination and uh, public finance. Um, uh, Chief Lamb and I were actually in Amsterdam on a smart city tour uh, recently. Um, and interestingly enough, the city of Amsterdam has done a pretty unique thing and sell a significant percentage of their, uh, their assets in a, public, in a u privately held utility to create a uh, smart city uh, 
climate, uh, smart climate, smart energy uh, fund, a $75 million fund of which they carve out 20 percent to, to um, create an accelerator fund for small businesses in the clean tech domain. Um, obviously, our public finance situation in this region is a little bit different than that. Obviously, uh, we don't necessarily have that opportunity. Um, but I do think that there's a concept there that, yes, as we reinvest in, uh, in uh, uh, specific development projects, um, there's an opportunity to um, uh, pool existing resources and existing uh, local technical expertise. But it does take, currently, a master chef uh, like uh, Richard Piacentini to utilize existing technology and existing resources to do a high-level investment, uh, such as the living building. Um, and so I think that there's a real opportunity for a coordination between resources in this room and the resources in this region to generate that type of fund that both attracts small businesses, allows entrepreneurs like myself and Colin Heiler to um, establish thriving businesses. Thanks. Aurora Sherrard Green Building Alliance. We ran such a fund uh, for five years called Product Innovation Grants. We awarded $1.2 million to 24 ideas uh, over five years. And some of those products are coming to fruition through Thrive Technologies, their geothermal activities. Uh, Energy Wall has a ventilation system in the center of the state. We, we threw out statewide and said, bring us your big green building ideas. Um, and I love that program. I ran that program. I learned so much. Um, but it was challenging in a lot of ways. There's this valley of death, as many of you in the funding world know, for these new technologies. And we really need to handhold them through that valley of death and so they can get into buildings and new developments and permeable roadways and all these sorts of things. Um, and I think that's the challenge before us. We're, we're trying to, uh, before all of us, we're, we're trying to go that middle road between the demand of these great new buildings and development parcels and the supply of the great clean tech products and services that we have people who want to provide. And I think that's what we need to figure out. We need to figure out how we can match those two up with both our regional opportunities for water, storm water, energy efficiency, uh, healthy buildings, and how we can gr get great products like wind stacks, uh, Thar Geothermal Bears products, you know, into these buildings and these places so people can really um, see them in action, see them in demonstration, and know that they can go other places too and be exported out of these technologies. When I hear Winstack say that they have so much demand that they can't meet it, like that's the type of company we need to say, okay, let's get them all over Pittsburgh and let's get them enough capacity so they can go elsewhere. And there are lots of small companies and entrepreneurs like that in Pittsburgh right now. Hi, I'm Walt Burlack with Renewable Manufacturing Gateway, and I'd like to pull us out of the valley of death, literally. It's uh, one of the things that our organization has recognized. We're about a four-year-old nonprofit, and one of the gaps that we see locally is a real need for that venture capital, that equity investment to be able to occur um, pretty much at the bottom of that valley of death or right before they go into it. Um, in addition to the technical assistance. And Pittsburgh is really lacking um, in that kind of investment capital. Um, so all of that money is coming from Chicago, New York, or from uh, California. And when those folks make those types of investments, typically they take more than 50% of the company, um, which means they have control. Um, and so a bunch of things can happen then. Um, and typically those companies move out of the area at some particular point. So one of the things that we've really been working on in four years of a lot of ups and downs with our organization is trying to identify how we can create that fund that you're talking about that can make that equity investment as a nonprofit that preserves the ownership of the entrepreneur so that they can stay in Pittsburgh. It's a really great example in Ontario um, called the Mars Project. Um, and uh, Mars is a incubator um, that is and this is what got me kicking, because uh, Mayor Peduto, you spoke at the pop-up Canada um, thing. And right before that, one of the gentlemen that, before you got there, one of the gentlemen per, that presented was uh, one of the executives with their incubator. And, and what the government has done, and this got me thinking, what the government has done is it's pulled together all of these accelerator, incubators, universities, like all, like, just like what you're doing here today, to make sure that they were talking with one another gave them a green zone in downtown Toronto, and then out of that green zone formed these hubs all across Ontario, and then they created a $40 million venture fund, which is privately operated. 
Um, and it's a really, really kind of a sexy program, but uh, that's definitely one of the things that we see as a major need. As folks were going through slides um, on, on sort of stuff, nobody mentioned money. And, uh, <laughs> and that makes everything go around. So, you know, a, a clear understanding of the financial stuff that needs to exist here in Pittsburgh um, to make those types of investments. And the state's moving in that direction, and I think people recognize that, but. And I'm, I apologize, I'm going to have to leave in a little bit too, but um, so and the funding is the key, right? It's because it's like the gas in a car. You can buy a Cadillac, but if it doesn't have any gas in it, it just sits in a driveway. Um, we can design these wonderful systems and talk about this, but if we're not actually getting behind it. So the first part is, you know, we're under a new normal. Um, there aren't these earmarks that used to be there at the federal level. Uh, the state hasn't enhanced any of the Main Street or Elm Street or any of the programs in decades, and in fact, they've eliminated many of them. So. We've got to be more creative in the way that we use the resources we have, whether it's a combined sewer overflow problem that's in the billions, or if it's a TIF which is in the millions, we have to be able to put these as parts of what will be that part so that we're using the money that's there differently. Second part, uh, Kevin Acklin, who's the Chief of Staff and the Chief Development Officer, is also the Chairman of the URA. I've given him the mission over the course of the next year or so to completely restructure that authority, to be able to look at it and to create the capacity within it to figure out what the core mission should be. Back when Davy Lawrence was the mayor, the picture's hanging over there, it's what it is what we do now, and we haven't really changed it since the 1950s. What we want to do is have two tracks. One, all the great stuff that's in this room, all the other stuff that gets us the accolades is top five for this, top city for that, top ten for this, throw gasoline on that fire have it so that there's a capacity built within that authority and the money that we spend to make sure that these things take off. Second part, to all the people that aren't a part of it, to the ones that have been left behind, to the ones that don't have a part in the new economy, develop the ladder of opportunity for them to join it. To give them, and especially the underskilled workers, the same opportunity my grandfather had working in a mill, and that's the opportunity to join the middle class. So. The URA right now doesn't function that way. When we spend tens of millions of dollars to bring big box retail into a neighborhood, something is absolutely wrong. Uh, to subsidize low income jobs and to watch our money go out instead of d d putting it into ways that we can make this happen, it has to be completely revamped. And we're going to do that so there will be funding for it. Hi, I'm Colin Heiler, uh, CEO of Optimus Technologies. And uh, Optimus builds fuel systems for medium and heavy-duty diesel engines to operate on renewable and sustainable fuels. Uh, we provide an opportunity for customers not only to uh, save on a per gallon cost um, compared to regular diesel, but also reduce um, overall carbon emissions uh, between 80 and 100 percent. So those are big numbers, especially for medium and heavy-duty trucks. Um, our company's in the process right now. We're, we're about to build the bridge, hopefully, over that, that valley of death that, that's being spoken about. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, we've been around for five years. Um, the past two years, we've been working with the city. We have a pilot project. We've been developing our technology. And five of the city's uh, municipal plow vehicles have been operating on our system for the past year. It gave us an opportunity to go through that development process validate the technology, work out the kinks, and um, earlier this year we received um, EPA approval. So from the EPA standpoint, we're the same as a GM. So this was an incredibly challenging process, but um, in working through the partnership and the development that we've had with the, with the city, we've been able to achieve this approval. We're the only company in the U.S., only company in the world that has this approval through the EPA. Um, for this type of technology. And now we're going, we're in the process of scaling up. And the city's been a really good incubator for us and, and to help kind of facilitate this. But now we need to take five vehicles that we've done at the city and, and make that meaningful and, and bring the technology to other municipalities, um, bring that technology and, and address uh, the overarching sustainability challenges that, that we have with a, a, an outdated transportation infrastructure. Um, just closing out on, on two kind of final comments. The first is that we look to other cities for funding. Boston has a clean tech investment community that's specifically focused on this. Um, 
San Francisco, California, any, anywhere we look, you know, and I, I appreciate the efforts being made to, to help bring Pittsburgh to there. And the second is we also have a unique uh, opportunity in the region with natural gas development. And that, that presents a, a very large challenge to, to us because uh, we're looking at nearsighted, short-term kind of cost reductions in the transportation sector that have overarching um, sustainability and climate change challenges. So it's, it's working to appropriately balance um, you know, sustainable long-term development with near-term economic opportunities, which are obviously very, very important to the region. So with that, I'd like to thank the mayor for hosting this and um, you know, the, the opportunity that we've been given for us to help validate the technology. I am Tom Feldman with Free Flow Power, uh, a Boston-based firm that's developing 10 hydroelectric projects uh, in and around the city of Pittsburgh. And I've heard a lot of talk about the challenges posed by the water resource in the region. And what we're trying to do is take that water resource, which is rich, and turn it into a variety of different things. First and foremost, renewable electricity that will be locally sourced and available for generations to come economic development opportunities in the form of construction jobs, um, and uh, an opportunity to incorporate these projects into the community in a way that benefits it, whether it's through working with local school systems to incorporate it into the STEM curriculum for K through 12 to make sure there's uh, a learning opportunity. Um, and so I, I, the, I want to make sure that there's a focus on marrying the challenge associated with the water resource with the opportunity that that presents, and we keep momentum going on that front. So we're hearing a couple of uh, trends so far. One, it sounds like logistics and coordination and management is an important thing. Another thing is leadership. So uh, the fact that the city and uh, the government is stepping up to try to send some positive signals, that's a good thing. Uh, we're also hearing some comments about financing and specifically uh, access to capital and access to leverage, which seems like that's maybe even a bigger deal so that companies that do, um, uh, that, that get some support also get to retain control and can continue to steer their destiny. So all of those are some things that are, are opportunities for us. Um, there, there, uh, you heard the mayor mention about uh, communities and, uh, that, that haven't been a part of this before. Um, so maybe it's time to talk a little bit more about that, about what we'd like to see to involve more people in this um, that have not traditionally been a part of it. Hey, Matt. Uh, I'm Pat Clark with Jackson Clark Partners. Pleasure to be here. I'm a constituent uh, of uh, Councilwoman Gross. I do most of my work as a firm. We help people make their communities better organizational and community planning in those neighborhoods that have been left out. Uh, we're the most livable city, as everyone knows. But the silent parenthetical is, for whom? Uh, this revolution has to be based in those communities. And uh, Mayor Peduto is committed to that. I've heard him speak again and again. But I think there's a couple of opportunities, he's in a, and he's outlined them. But the, the, the one that he left out is where the city, and uh, no small part thanks to uh, Mr. Peduto's diligence in getting it, uh, we got a $30 million HUD Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grant, uh, one of the largest grants uh, from the federal government the city's ever gotten directly. And that embedded in that uh, plan is, uh, and I worked on the neighborhood plan that developed this, is uh, the development of a green industrial zone along the Hamilton Avenue and Frankstown Road Boulevard. Actually, our partners include Sustainable Pittsburgh and the Penn State Center on that. What does that mean? That's an opportunity. How do we do that? That's the opportunity. And I think if you can build on that scale around some federal dollars that may attract more investment, figure out how you can incrementally work with those partners like GTEC strategies that are out there, and then figure out what that prototype is, you'll be ready when you have those huge developments that are going to happen in those areas um, surrounding it. So my hope is that that can be a focus area. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a great point. I mean, we there, there's really, I guess in my mind, two areas where the capital access is important. Uh, at the front end, so to speak, on the product side for our local small businesses uh, so that they have the VC funding to make sure that uh, they can go out of that valley of death, so to speak, and, and really emerge with a commercialized product that can be used uh, at the end use. 
Um, the second key area is, is was mentioned, $30 million uh, HUD grant. I know uh, Jackie Erickson from Senator Casey's office is here as well. That was really uh, you know, a great effort moving forward at providing uh, economic development dollars. And, and one of the things I think the state can do um, and, and something that I'm getting ready to propose um, is uh, providing a mechanism by which that capital um, can be tied and, and accessed directly for commercial and industrial retrofits in certain areas, whatever uh, that particular may be, area may be. Um, and we haven't decided whether to focus on specific areas or just uh, have the bill, um, and, and we're working on the language now, but it'll be Senate Bill 1352 in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, whether that will be tied to specific areas, so to speak, green, green innovation zones, or um, opened up to the Commonwealth itself. And uh, the way that we're going to generate revenue there and, and a pool of capital is to allow municipalities or uh, multi-municipal um, authorities to be formed, whereby those municipal entities would, would float bonds. That bond money could then be used to provide um, grants and loans to commercial or industrial uh, owners of property to do retrofits on their existing property. Uh, that would then be repaid by those commercial or industrial owners uh, as an assessment on their property taxes. Uh, so they would be able to amateur, amateur, amateurize, 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 excuse me, uh, that money uh, over the long term. Uh, they would be able to achieve uh, the cost savings on the energy side, use those cost savings to pay back uh, that particular loan, uh, if it's a loan or if it's a grant, they wouldn't have to, but if it's a loan, pay it back over the life of that property. And by tying it to the property, uh, we're um, not only uh, tying it to the beneficial use uh, of that property, but we're tying it in the event that that property is sold, the payback period would be tied to the property. So any successor uh, owner of that particular property would uh, be on the hook for the repayment. So. I, I think that that access to capital is a huge part of the issue here, and it's both, I think, at the front end when those products are developed, as well as on the back end when developers are coming into an area uh, or an existing um, industrial or commercial owner looking to do a retrofit of an existing um, structure. So the opportunity is to create a, a, a chances where there are there is core funding that is low risk because the government has stepped up and, and uh, attracted that money and that can become an attractive core that can leverage even more investment. Uh, and the other thing is uh, rewarding efficiency. So constructing um, uh, agreements, financial agreements that reward efficiency improvements um, so that um, you know if you're putting some money up front to make something work better or more efficiently, that reward um, the, the, the barriers, the, the cost up front are not barriers for being able to achieve it, but the financial structuring of it can make it function um, and reward people who step up to do that. Okay. Other comments from folks that um, we haven't heard from nonprofits here. So we have a rich nonprofit sector and also the university sector. Some more on what can happen on the university side. Um, anyone want to comment from what's going on in those sectors? One, one thing in particular that we've found at the city is the ability to partner directly with the university sector and nonprofit sector to help us leverage our capacity. I mean, one of the struggles that we have as a city of Pittsburgh is limited bandwidth. You know, we had a, a footprint that was much larger 10 years ago in terms of our workforce, uh, but yet 10 years later we're still with the demand of the services that we need to provide. And one of the things that we've looked to is the ability to partner with NGOs and with universities to help extend our ability to not just deliver services per se, but to really encourage the innovation. Uh, so working directly with foundations or community-based organizations like GTEC or the Pennsylvania Environmental Council to help us from a coordination function, but also encouraging greater connectivity with neighborhoods to understand things that are going on on the ground. You know, one of the things that Stan talked about early on with regards to Sustainable City Year really provides us a model that can connect between universities, between the private sector, and between he us here in the city, where we can have the opportunity to create a rotation, if you will, to bring that talent and time 
that comes from a student at the University of Pittsburgh or Carnegie Mellon or Chatham, et cetera, or a research body uh, on a particular project. Uh, you know, later on today in the Department of Innovation and Performance, we're going to be going through a list of 15 to 20 different projects that are out there. I think I just added a couple, Deborah. Um, uh, I sense nervousness. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, really starting to build that pipeline, an R&D pipeline, if you will, from the city standpoint in terms of us connecting, you know, with the, intelligent, the intelligentsia that's out there that's thinking about these issues. Um, but the idea then to kind of leverage that to private sector partners like Bayer or Winstax or Optimus, et cetera, uh, that every student affords themselves that opportunity to work in the city or with a private sector partner and really starting to build a sustainability workforce uh, so that we're able to extend uh, kind of knowledge and, and share and integrate and work better together. So um, leveraging opportunities that uh, our region has, you, we also heard mentioned today that uh, water is also a very important thing. Uh, uh, just on NPR this morning, there was a discussion about the crisis they're facing on the West Coast because of drought, and uh, some of their aquifers uh, are 75% depleted. They can't be recharged very quickly. We happen to be in a water-rich region, uh, and we also have a lot of technologies in our region. So I don't know if there, um, Steve, would you like to comment on what's happening with the water economy? Yeah, um, Steve McKnight, I'm with um, Fourth Economy Consulting. I'm here today on behalf of one of our clients, the Water Economy Network. And that, that is a group of uh, industry folks that have come together, both legacy companies and smaller mid-sized companies, to um, address some of the water challenges um, through new technology and innovation. I think one of the big takeaways um, when we think about that experience um, is that we can't forget about the legacy companies, the, the, the deep, rich resources we have within the Pittsburgh region here, um, within our uh, legacy industries. They're a source of not only uh, technology and innovation, but also financial resources to invest in uh, new technologies and, and new ideas that can come from this. Um, water represents a huge opportunity uh, through the challenges uh, that um, I think you know, we're talking about here today. So our legacy companies, the Water Economy Network, and, uh, and all that that represents, I think, is part of the, uh, part of the solution as well. Thanks. Also along those lines from the environmental perspective is, um, and going along with the, uh, the hearings that are happening in Pittsburgh today, is the issue of climate and how much climate is entering into the, to the picture of how our region is prepared to respond and what that means economically um, and from a leadership position. Um, we have Lindsay Baxter is here from uh, Pennsylvania Environmental Council and who's uh, been head of the climate initiative for some time. Sure. Thanks, Matt. I'm Lindsay Baxter. Um, I have the honor of partnering with the mayor's office to be the co-convener of the Pittsburgh Climate Initiative, which is a multi-sector collaborative um, of which several of our members are in the room. Um, it was founded when the city adopted its first climate action plan because there wasn't as much capacity at the city level and city government at that point um, to sort of guide implementation of that plan and updates of that plan so it didn't become just something that sits on a bookshelf somewhere. And we've seen such an evolution of the leadership and government bringing us to this point. And as I'm sitting around the table and hearing each of you talk about collaboration, building networks, how do we take advantage of each other's resources, um, I, I have a thought, and it might be that you say, Lindsay, we're already doing that, and then the conversation can just move on. But, you know, Mayor Peduto had talked about um, the work that, that his office and that the URA are doing to help entrepreneurs to attract and recruit other clean tech businesses. And I'm just curious to what extent in that area there's business to business recruiting happening. All of you have suppliers, probably many of you have business customers. Um, are we in any way as a region sort of surveying you for who those folks are and whether it makes sense to try to recruit them to having an operation within Pittsburgh? Any responses to that? 
be, I'd be interested in Ron, maybe on your perspective in terms of that supply, in terms, in terms of the supply chain connectivity, right? I mean, one of the things that uh, we were speaking about, Matt and I, earlier this morning was just that idea that, you know, part of sustainability, and, and Richard mentioned it in his remarks, you know, the proximity of the market and the, you know, production value that occurs just within 500 miles of Pittsburgh. Um, how do we start to link that network together? Um, you know, because I, I appreciate what Lindsay's saying. Like, there's huge opportunity for the business community to be our voice uh, and help that happen. Yes, and, uh, thank you, Grant. So I mentioned our location decision criteria uh, previously. Uh, you know, there's a long list of, of things <coughs> that um, help, helped us decide where we wanted to be. Once we decided on the Pittsburgh region, why didn't we go to Westmoreland County in a nice shiny building? Why didn't we go up north to Butler and be, you know, on and on and on? But we kept coming back to Smallman Street. It's not just because of all the great restaurants there. Uh, it's not just because of this great nitty gritty 100 year old building we're in, although those are all parts of it. Uh, we, in, in fact, as Deborah was just speaking, I wrote on the back of her uh, cheat sheet there, uh, District 7 equals clean technology cluster. We basically have the makings of a clean technology cluster already. Uh, we have suppliers within walking distance of us. Everything from, we have three different paint manufacturers we walk to. When, when we have to go down the street to Granger's, we jump on a bike and go pick up a part. Uh, and, and the list just goes on and on. We have some of the best PR companies uh, blocks away you know, when we have lunch with them. And, and any of you all familiar with urban planning and, and regional planning, clusters are so critical. Uh, you can't really always put your finger on what it is, why people like to be together. Actually, there, there, there's a, uh, uh, something called hoteling that's actually well, well studied in, in, in urban planning. But, that's why we're there, and that's why we're committed uh, to the strip, even though we've already outgrown our, our building. And, you know, I really wish 20 years ago we hadn't got rid of every tall building and every crane in Pittsburgh because we really need them right now. Um, we still want to be in, in that region. So I would just throw it out, toss it out on the table that merely the stroke of a pen and a little PR, you could already have a clean technology cluster started. And that's what helps uh, uh, folks like even Bear, and if they want to participate in, uh, what, uh, in smaller companies, and as they always do, by the way, they kind of know where to go. And, and as Colin also mentioned, we're up chasing uh, money up in New York City, too. So I just wanted to throw my two cents in there. Pittsburgh is generally very conservative on the VC side. Um, and even the economic development agencies who are in Pittsburgh, they're, they're great. They're following 25-year-old models, frankly. Um, so they really don't move as fast as we like to move. They don't embrace, uh, you know, a green energy a, a, the way that we do. You know, our idea of clean technology in Pennsylvania has been gas instead of coal so far. So uh, you know, we need we need to kind of get get to that next step, and that's my idea. And uh, Grant, I think uh, that was a good suggestion on your part, the clustering. Add to that, from Bear's perspective, we've been in Pittsburgh since 1960, the material science uh, division, and uh, we're often asked, you know, are we staying? And, and one of the reasons that we often state about our, our commitment to the city of Pittsburgh is because we realize that there's a lot of uh, rich information and, and technology development opportunities out there. So I mentioned before the Energy Innovation Center with Pittsburgh Gateways. That's where we get, we see our opportunities to see how the market is using our technologies and what the future market needs are. So, yeah, I mean, we're definitely interested in participating in, in the upstart companies and, and the things that are, you know, riding the crest for the future because we want to be involved in that. So you brought up the idea of the Energy Innovation Center. Uh, Bill's here from, from there, and maybe sure. he can give us some, some of his wisdom and thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking one of the uh, only advantages of getting old is that you watch yourself go through history in many different phases here at Pittsburgh. So we've had our transitions and our renaissances, and uh, I really believe we're at a time now that it's going to be a dramatic change in the, in the region, and it's a very important one. In a nutshell, the Energy Innovation Center, you may have noticed uh, up on the hill, it's adjacent to the old Civic Arena. It's the old Conley Trade School. 
we're in the process of renovating it. We've raised $70 million to do that. Uh, we're hoping to still open in uh, September with our first classes there. Uh, there's lots of opportunity. I, I want to mention three of them. One, uh, we will be a convener and a, a, a coordinator and a contributor to energy system development. So we want to integrate so many of the things that are going on in the region. It was mentioned that maybe this coordination function is something that we haven't been extremely good at, and it is an opportunity for us to bring the corporate community into exhibiting their products and showing them being used in the building. We met not only the commercial tax credits, but the historic tax credits, uh, as well as met lead uh, standard, uh, platinum lead standards, uh, mostly because of the bear contributions that, that they've made with uh, installation, for example. So we can work in conjunction with uh, so many of the technology companies that are coming into, uh, into play. We'd like to exhibit over 32 different kinds of energy systems there. So wind, we need to talk, Ron. But we've talked about different architectures and use of solar panels, for example, and geothermal and uh, cogeneration with gas. The other major activity, of course, is around the training piece. So we want to add a, a significant portion on the academic side as post-secondary courses that we can work in conjunction with CCAC and CMU, Pitt, Penn State, Duquesne, and Robert Morris. Uh, and we also will have a, 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 an extensive workforce development program to try to meet the skills of the, uh, the energy community as it continues to grow. So we're pretty excited. You're welcome to come anytime to see the center. Uh, you have to wear your hard hat and your yellow jacket, but uh, Grant has been with us, uh, and the mayor is coming, I think, in a week. So uh, we're almost through this first uh, phase, and there'll be more about what we intend to do as, as we move forward. It's been great to be here, by the way. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. So that's um, a second um, response where um, if there's a question of well, where could a home uh, for clean tech be, um, you know, the Energy Innovation Center is one home. We also heard about the Strip District and all the great stuff that's happening there. So there are homes that are already in place and ready for this to happen. Um, the question is, well, how do we activate them? How do we make sure that they are performing as strongly and as um, um, much on the front lines uh, as possible in a, in a model. So um, uh, what, what we want to do now is try to wrap this up with, uh, with the thought of what we need to do next, what people would like to see that we do uh, as a region specifically with the city's leadership um, moving forward. If there's one thing that you could recommend that we start doing right away, you know, what would that be? Um, maybe someone from, from over here, we haven't comment on. I think, um, you know, back to Ron's point and, uh, and of course the whole reason we're here, you know, today with the mayor bringing everyone together, I think just starting to brand this and starting to identify this. I mean, we're, we're very good at, you know, kind of following the self-fulfilling prophecies of if we start talking about being a new city or a smart city or a green city or a clean tech city, you know, especially when it comes from, you know, we're fortunate to have progressive leadership in the mayor and the county executive and and uh, in our state legislators. And, you know, I mean, if we start to to be able to encourage that, just not just external messaging, but also internally, I think that can be a good first step. And we already have local champions. Hi, my name is Paul Barrero. I'm an industrial designer uh, here in Pittsburgh, and I'm blown away by this. I've never seen anything like this. This is really incredible. I'm kind of a newcomer to uh, sustainability, although I've been uh, creating uh, products for companies for over 20 years. And I'm also a little bit amazed at how uh, very little uh, people are mentioned uh, as customers, as uh, people's needs, and what are people's problems. There's a lot of uh, discussion about investment and, and of course, and technology, and that's incro incredibly important. I would say one of the things to consider is to rise people's needs at that level uh, as fast as you can. 
Uh, and you know, one way to do it is, and I talked to, uh, I had a conversation with, with Grant a, a while ago. Uh, we have, uh, in, in the design community, uh, human-centered design methods, uh, which involve getting people together in a room and, and using these methods to understand uh, people's needs and really, really get at the core. Uh, Ron, you mentioned uh, embracing green. And I think that's the real problem here. I mean, when you talk about uh, people not really investing into it, I'm wondering is, you know, are they really embracing it and what that means and what that means for our future? You know, when people are using uh, uh, recycling bins and they don't use them correctly, you know, what's really going on in their behavior? And, and, and I think if that, that would be one suggestion that I would give. No, and, and let me add to, uh, you know, in a lot of our interactions with private industry sector folks, I think doing what you're doing right now is critically important, and that's setting the agenda, uh, communicating where the projects are and what the vision looks like, and uh, the more that that is reaffirmed with uh, the, the private sector partners, both the large companies and the small companies, um, they'll respond to the challenge, and, the, and they'll figure out, you know, where, where they sit in that continuum, and I think that's a you know just a critical role for the for the office to play, and and I think you're doing it uh, right right out of the gate. So it's, it's all good. Two two quick ideas. Uh, one, um, I think there's a real opportunity, regardless of, of of what and how we brand it, which is certainly an opportunity. I think to develop a very focused community resiliency agenda, a part of that branding campaign. I think that. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for specific industries to thrive here, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to be very intentional around uh, how we connect uh, typically distressed and underserved communities to those industries. And I think we need to stop waiting, right? I think every one of us needs to make sure that in every conversation we bring up the question and we challenge the status quo, because I'm tired of waiting. This administration is tired of waiting. You know, it can't just be GBA, the Climate Initiative, GTEC, you know, WinStax. We all need to ask the question of every project, company, whatever it is that comes through and say, you know, how is this clean? How is this efficient? How is it sustainable? How is it green? How is this putting Pittsburgh in the future, not where we are today, but 150 years from now? So. I had two questions, or two ideas. But the other one was a quick one. Um, we're very fortunate that Business Forward and the uh, uh, the White House uh, Business Council is here, um, and I think there's a real opportunity. Please keep networking us with national best practices. Um, I think there's a lot of hunger for that. It's wonderful that you're here. I really hope that we can continue that dialogue. Just to build off of uh, Aurora's impatience, uh, the impatience <laughs> isn't just here. The impatience is among investors. The event that Grant and I were at this morning, we had someone from Bloomberg come and talk about uh, what investors are interested in, uh, particularly with the issue of transparency. And they showed pictures of Bloomberg's analysts' screens on their computers where there's an industry that's identified, perhaps transportation, and all of the top companies are listed there with a hundred different criteria that they're using to evaluate the performance of those companies. And very important to that are sustainability-related questions and also if information is missing or omitted, investors know that now. They know that by getting those reports and downloading them and seeing where the money is. So the idea of transparency, connecting to real needs, community needs, um, and connecting to stakeholders is really the front line, and investors are impatient about that information now. So we are in a strong position to move forward um, and your impatience is, is right in line with where we need to be. So, um, and we appreciate the mayor uh, at bringing us together uh, for listening uh, to, to everyone here in the room and um, look forward to more discussion. So thank you, Grant. Great, great. We give a round of applause to Matt. <laughs> Matt has had a busy day today. Uh, he has been up very early coordinating a great event hosted by uh, sustainable Pittsburgh, as we had alluded to, uh, for their Champions of Sustainability series. Just to kind of bring this together, I think this has been a fabulous kickoff, a great start uh, for a very important and timely conversation. Just a couple of things we heard, you know, really the opportunity to build a brand, 
uh, to not accept the status quo and to ask the right questions uh, to address Aurora's impatience, to really push the envelope. She's right. We have an opportunity today uh, by pulling together and having this conversation to, you know, take advantage of the clusters that are forming in places like uh, Lawrenceville in the Strip District and along the Frankstown uh, and Hamilton Avenue corridors, because this is where action is occurring. Let's, let's find ways to support that. The other opportunity really is to address people's needs. You know, Paul's point is well taken. You know, right now one of the things that we're investigating is how do we reimagine the city's recycling program. And that has impacts not just on residents and your neighbors, but also with regards to how we collect containers and the types of capital equipment that are required to improve those systems. So what does that mean? We'll need people like Paul to help us with that industrial design question. Also the opportunity to build community resilience, to engage the community in conversation so that they understand that benefit of the connection between climate and opportunity and economic wherewithal. Um, and then finally, you know, really, I think it's continuing this dialogue. You know, so how can we find ways in which we can continue this conversation to really productive means, whether it's supporting the Energy Innovation Center, uh, looking at new ways that we can incorporate uh, products like uh, Optimus's technology or Winstacks in terms of the new developments and capital programs that we're all developing, uh, both here at the city and other local government entities, but in your businesses as well. Um, so with that, I want to uh, thank you and uh, turn it over to Chief Lamb, uh, who's going to give you a little preview of future roundtable events that we'll be hosting here today. But thank you once again. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, you know, I'm a boomeranger, and it's coming back to Pittsburgh, and I've been in many cities, and this, this is an amazing collection. This group, you would, we would be on par with the world's greatest cities. Um, and it's really great for me to sit back and observe and hear this kind of discussion and to really uh, be part of this great group and be part of moving this initiative and agenda going forward. Um, like I said, just to take this a step forward, um, this is going to be a first of many dialogues and discussions. Right after this, um, we will be sending you a summary report that kind of um, headlines a lot of these actions and distills the key messages. Um, this is the uh, second of four round tables we're hosting this summer. The first round table happened in uh, mid-June uh, with the maker community. Um, this is the second one. Um, next Wednesday, we'll be hosting a round table with the accelerator, uh, incubator kind of community. And then we'll have a fourth round table with startups. And in all of these round tables, as you see here, it's really asking what is the role of the city? and pushing innovation forward. How can we as the city, um, you know, really encourage what's already great and organically happening, but how can we collectively uh, spur this and take this into a next step forward? These roundtables and continuous dialogues will then spur into an innovation roadmap or an action plan that we as the city will take the lead and implement it, but we collectively will be able to take concrete action items and move forward and track that progress. So it's beyond District 7. It'll be throughout the whole region, um, but really positioning Pittsburgh nationally and internationally. Um, and as I said before, I don't think Pittsburgh is, is any less in terms of green, sustainable, resilience. We just haven't been um, positioning ourselves um, or branding ourselves in that way. Um, and we are very much um, at that par as shown by this collective group. So thank you again. Thank you for coming. Um, special thanks to Grant and Claire for really putting this together. Special thanks to the city cable team for making this possible and making this air. And uh, we'll, we'll circle back and really communicate this further. But thank you.